guys, what's going on? I'm Tim along with John here. Usually this is a Tuesday night baseball show, but because of uh, conflicts with our scheduling, we had to move it to Wednesday this week, and there really is no reason it wouldn't be back on Tuesday next week, and for the remainder of the summer and the entire baseball season, we will be here, and in a couple weeks we'll start doing the show live on the Blitz Hardcore Podcast at Blog Talk Radio slash Blitz Hardcore Podcast. For those of you who are watching this on any other place, that's where you're going to want to go check this show out. There's a live chat room and everything. So go ahead and do that. Today we're going to talk about Mariano Rivera out for the season. Albert Pools hits first home run. Cole Hamels, Beans, Bryce Harper, and Josh Hamilton hits four home runs. But first, we are going to go over the standings. John's going to give you a rundown of each division, and we're going to break down each division. So, John, go ahead, man. All right, with the American League East, for the first place right now, the Baltimore Orioles are 19 and 11. Second place, the Tampa Bay Rays are also 19-11, tied. Third place, the New York Yankees are 16-13. and Fourth place, the Toronto Blue Jays are 17-14. and And last place, the Boston Red Sox are 12-17. and Yeah, I mean, in this division, I, I cannot see the Baltimore Orioles staying up there. Their pitching, as we saw last night, is just not going to be good enough to keep them up there. I like them. I like what Buck Showalter's done with that team, but they're not going to be good enough. Tampa Bay's playing great baseball right now, and they've done it the whole year. The Yankees are right in a good position because they have a lot of talent coming back already. Andy Pettit will join the club this weekend, and we'll get to that in a second. They're 16-13, and 13, two and a half games out, and they're probably still overall, if not the best division, best team in this division, they are the second best team, and a team that should be a lock for the playoffs. The Jays, on the other end, though, two and a half games out, that's something you don't want to see, because teams that somewhat overachieve, they tend to have these rough spots in the season, and if the Jays are really going to make a run at this division, they're going to have to build a lead in preparation that... That is probably going to happen at some point in the season. And I'm, I, I still think that they are the fourth best team overall in this division. They'll probably finish in third place, but I think they're the fourth best team. And then the Red Sox are just continue to be a mess right now. And a lot of people down there are panicking at this point. Or up there, I should say, because it's pretty north, far north. But uh, what do you think, John? Yeah, you summed it up pretty well. Baltimore will not last this long. We saw this yesterday. Ever since that 17th inning game with Boston, their bullpen has looked dead and just their whole pitching, really. Boston, they're only 4-10 at Fenway this year. I don't know what's going on with them. Like we were talking about earlier with Beckett, the supposed golf thing. I mean, the chemistry's coming into play again. It just seems like there's a different distraction in Boston every other week now. Yeah, and it always seems like they have these games. They'll, they'll put together a two- or three-game stretch where it kind of looks like, okay, no one's taking notice of this because of all the issues that they've had, but maybe they're finally breaking out of it. And every time they have that, then they'll go and lose or get swept the next series. So I don't know. Their run differential this season is minus eight. That is the worst in the division. They're only negative team in that division. And with that lineup, it really shows you how much the pitching has struggled this season. All right, on to the AL Central. All right, for the AL Central, in first place right now are the Cleveland Indians in a 17 and 12 record. In second place, in two games back from the Indians, the Detroit Tigers are 15 and 14. In third place, <coughs> are the Chicago White Sox who are 14 and 17. In fourth place, are the Kansas City Royals who are 10 and 19. And then last, please, are the Minnesota Twins, who are 8-21 and and 9 games back. All right, I mean, with the Twins, it really looks like this kind of regime that's worked might be up. Ron Gar Gardenhire has been a great manager there, but maybe it's time to look in a different direction. That Joe Maurer deal, man, I mean, Joe Maurer was such a good player, but he was not worth what they paid him, the $23 million a season for eight years, and they've really seen it here. The pitching... They really needs attention, and they just don't have a ton of money to go put it there. Justin Morneau's come back and done decently, but the Twins overall are a mess. The Royals, I think, will still end up being a pretty decent team. They're 10 and 19, but what people have to understand is that they had a stretch in there where they lost about 10 in a row. So if you take that out, they're about 10 and 9 out of that stretch. So they really haven't. I mean, obviously that stretch was horrendous, but I think that they do get out of that stretch. The White Sox, on the other hand. I don't think that they are even a 14 and 17 team. I think that they're overachieving at 14 and 17. And the Tigers, 
15 and 14, nice spot. Prince Fielder went through a bit of a dry spell there, but he appears to be back. And the Cleveland Indians quietly at 17 and 12 have looked really good this year. I've been impressed by a lot of the young players on the, on that team. And I think that that's a team that people have slept on. And I think I was guilty of doing that early on in the season as well. Yeah, I still think Detroit's the best team in this division right now, though. At the end of the year, I think Cleveland will come in second or even third. Kansas City might catch him at second. It's very early, but Cleveland's playing very well right now. But Detroit, once Prince Fielder is starting to get locked in with Miggy, and there's even talks about Victor Martinez maybe coming back this year. I mean, they have one of the best lineups in baseball right now. Yeah, and with the Victor Martinez thing, if you can add him back into the lineup... A th a Victor Martinez, a guy who hit like 320 last year. You add him into Miguel Cabrera, a guy who hit 330 last year, and or 340 last year, I think it was 330, 340, somewhere right in that area. And you add that on to Prince Fielder, who was capable of hitting 45 home runs. You might not need a ton of pitching, and that, I mean they they certainly are not one of the more pitching deep, deep teams after Justin Verlander. You might not need a ton without that. But let's move on to the AL West. All right, for the AL West, in first place are the Texas Rangers in a 20 and 10 record. In second place are the o Oakland Athletics at a 16 and 15 record, and four and a half games at back from the Texas Rangers. Third place are the Seattle Mariners who are 14 and 18, and then last place are the Los Angeles Angels who are 13 and 18. All right, with Texas, hands down, I think that they are the best team in the game right now. We've seen what Josh Hamilton's done. You Darvish has looked great this season. I think Texas is the best team in the game. Oakland has gotten some nice starting performances. While they traded away Trevor Cahill and Gio Gonzalez this past offseason, what they've done is they've gotten some good performances from Dallas Braden, who came back this season. Brandon McCarthy, who I can tell you firsthand, is not a very friendly guy. And then if you look at Seattle, 14-18, Jesus Montero's look pretty good. I mean, Seattle is not going to be a team that's going to be above 500. But to be honest with you, if, the, if this Seattle team can win 75 games, it's probably a successful season. The Angels are at 13 and 18, but the difference between them and some of the other bigger teams that are really struggling is you can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel with them. And I think that they will turn things around and become competitive very soon. I expect a big week out of this team. Yeah, I mean, it's already it's only May, but, I mean, the Angels are seven and a half games out of Texas already. And like you said, I really think Texas is the best team in baseball right now. Bad news for Oakland, Yo Jonas Suspet is, is supposedly hurt. And if he's out for a while, that's a huge blow to that lineup. He's been their best player this year so far offensively. Seattle, I mean, they're an up-and-coming team. Jesus Montero is the future for them. And the Angels, I mean, they don't even look like they have any heart right now. I was watching the other day. I mean, no chemistry really. But once this team starts going, I mean, their lineup and pitching rotation is too good for them to have a 13 and 18 record right now. Yeah, things will turn around there. And with the A's, the one thing to keep in mind is they're only about 20 games away from take this as you will, getting Manny Ramirez potentially into that lineup. We'll see how that works out. But Manny Ramirez, at age 38, we'll see what he still has left, having not played last season. But it's certainly something that could really pay off in their favor. Yeah, definitely. Look over to the NL East now. All right, the National League East, the first place are the Washington Nationals with an 18-11 and 11 record. And second place are the Atlanta Braves with a 19-13 and 13 record. In third place are the New York Mets with a 17 and 13 record. In fourth place are the Miami Marlins at a 15 and 15 record. And in the last place are the Philadelphia Phillies with a 14 and 17 record. Washington at 18 and 11. My only concern with them would be down the stretch, and they, they did lose Jason Worth for six weeks after he broke his wrist on Sunday Night Baseball last week. But my only real concern with this team is that down the stretch, their young pitchers like Steven Strasburg might not be able to throw as many innings. They're in a tough position because he's coming off Tommy John surgery, and he is your future. You might feel like if you're the Nationals that you can compete to maybe go to the playoffs this year. And maybe they do feel like they can win the World Series. I don't know. But down the stretch, you're going to have to make the decision, okay, we can't give, make him throw 220-some innings this year like a normal ace would because his arm just is not ready for it at this point. You need to 
work his way up the next few seasons to get him to that point and hope that he does not get injured. And that's the one tough thing that Washington is going to run into this year. The Braves quietly at 19-13, and 13, the team that I picked to win the National League. Jason Hayward is having a really nice season, and Delgado has done a nice job pitching for them as well. they got Tim Hudson back. The Mets, 17-13, and 13, is not pretty the way they do it, but they continue to kind of stay afloat right now. Miami, 15-15, and 15, has actually had a pretty nice week. And then the Phillies, 14-17, and 17, have had the worst bullpen in baseball. And that's pretty tough, considering that you've had the closer who's probably been the best overall in baseball so far. But the rest of the bullpen has been a mess. Cliff Lee's been out, and... I mean, it's just been a mess. Roy Halladay's even had some bad starts for this team. Joe Blinn has really been a nice starter for them this season, which has come to a surprise to some people. I thought he'd have a nice year because he has really slimmed down and he's been able to go deeper into games this season. Yeah, I'm going to have to disagree, disagree with you for Washington, though. I really think this team's legit. Watching them from this area, I watch them almost every game. This team, I think, has enough depth. And players in the minor leagues like Triple A, they can call up. I think this team can make it, win the East, and make a good run in the playoffs. The Atlanta Braves, very good team, will be the second in the East, I think. New York Mets, I mean the Mets aren't even. I mean they're they're seven, not staying, they're seventeen enough. and thirteen, but they're not like playing w well. It's kind of confusing. I mean they're winning by like one and two. I mean a win's a win though. The Marlins, I think this is a very interesting team to watch. Their rotation right now is looking very nice. And you have to remember, Josh Johnson's ERA is in the six right now. So if he gets back going, this team could definitely catch up to the first or second. Philadelphia Phillies, one of the worst ballpins in the league right now. Like you said, you've summed that up pretty well. Yeah, Chad Qualls has been absolutely awful. But uh, yeah. we'll see. On to the NL Central. All right, for the NL Central, in first place are the St. Louis Cardinals with a 19 and 11 record. Second place are the Cincinnati Reds with a 16 and 14 record. In third place are the Houston Astros with a 14 and 16 record. In fourth place are the Pittsburgh Pirates with a 13 and 16 record. In fifth place are the Chicago Cubs with a 13 and 18 record. And in last place are the Milwaukee Brewers with a 13 and 18 record. Alright, out of those last four, the only team that I really look at that could potentially even make a playoff run would be Milwaukee. Zach Greinke pitched really well today and still did not was not able to get enough run support to win this game. Chicago, Houston, and Pittsburgh are all bad teams. They're not going to the playoffs. Pittsburgh maybe could be like a 500 team. I don't even see that, but it's possible. With the top two, St. Louis has been 19-11. They've been hitting really well. And Lance Lynn, 6-0. and Steven Strasburg, to a lot of people, has been the silent winner. But Lance Lynn, who was only 24 years old, has surprised a lot of people. Carpenter's been out. Wainwright struggled early on. And what Lance Lynn has been able to do is help really propel this team to a 19-11 record with some big hitting. So far this season, Lance Lynn is 6-0 and in 38.2 innings with a 140 ERA and a 0 0.85 whip. John talked about him a few weeks ago and is kind of one of those guys that we said, all right, he'll probably end up winning 14 or so games. Right now, he really looks like a guy who's going to end up winning 17 to 20 games rather than those 14 to 18 games. And then the Reds at 16 to 14 are still in a nice spot. 16 to 14 in May is fine. All Star break right before the All Star break, like in the middle middle of June is when you really see the teams that are going to be good separate. At this point, if you're a few games over 500, or even in some cases if you have a lot of talent, a few games under or right at 500, then you're in fi perfect shape to end up making a run down the stretch. Yeah, I mean, the NL Central, I think, is definitely between St. Louis and Cincinnati. I didn't even see any of the bottom four even contending this year. Milwaukee just doesn't look the same right now. I don't think they will produce at all. And a big blow for them with Alex Gonzalez, their starting shortstop, out for the year with an ACL tear. I mean, St. Louis is the best team in the National League right now. They're doing pitching. I mean, just imagine this team once Wainwright comes back to his old self. I mean, they might not be touched. It's looking like a Cardinals-Rangers World Series from right now. Cincinnati's playing well. It's going to be between them all year. Yeah, and after that World Series last year, I'm not sure too many people would be opposed to seeing Cardinals-Rangers rematch. Yeah. Alright, look on to the NL West now. 
All right, in first place in the National League West are the Los Angeles Dodgers with a 19 and 11 record. Second place are the San Francisco Giants with a 15 and 15 record. Third place are the Arizona Diamondbacks with a 14 and 17 record. In fourth place are the Colorado Rockies with a 13 and 17 record. And in last place are the San Diego San Diego Padres with a 11 and 21 record. All right, the Padres record speaks for itself, really. They they're just not a very good team. And the Rockies are a mediocre team, I think. They're a 78 to 83 win team, probably closer to 78. Arizona and San Francisco are both, I still think, the best two teams in this division. And I mean, certainly, I, I especially think that Arizona is the best team in this division. They're both right in a decent spot for uh, making a push when it really comes time to. Los Angeles continues to play well. I'm. I'm waiting for something to go wrong with this team, but at home at Chavez Ravine, they've been 11-3 and this season. On the road, they've only been 8-8. Eight and eight. That's not terrible, but you want to see them improve on the road a bit. At home this season, they've basically been unbeatable, and Matt Kemp continues to just light it up. Yeah, I mean, one concern right now, though, for, I'm going to the Arizona Diamondbacks, is Justin Upton right now. He's not having a good year, not seeing the ball very good, striking out a ton so far. I think he's one of the leaders in the National League. Uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Arizona, they might all come down. This might be a very exciting race at the end of the year. I think it might be the, uh, the three would be five games back, and the first two will be right there. It's going to be a very exciting way at the end of the year. I got San Francisco coming close, but I got Dodgers winning it. Yeah, and if anyone called it, it was John at the beginning of the season. John did call when we made our NL preview that he believed that the Dodgers would surprise a lot of people and end up making the playoffs. So we shall see. That is your standings for the week. Now let's look on to some of the news and notes. And we begin with Mariano Rivera, the greatest closer of all time in pretty much everyone's opinion. Rivera last week was shagging fly balls, went back for one. I mean, this is something he's always done. It wasn't really something that he did wrong or he could have really avoided. He went back and turned his knee the wrong way, and he ended up tearing his ACL, as many had early on predicted. And Mariano Rivera is now, in all likelihood, out for the season. It's not impossible that he could come back for the playoffs, but ACL is really not something that you just come back from in five or six month, that, months. That is much closer to 10 or 11 month, or 9 or 10 month injury than a 5 or 6 month injury. He could come back, maybe, but I'm just not sure that that would be a great idea. Now, a lot of people believed, including myself, that that might have been it for Mariano Rivera at age 42 with his contract up at the end of the season. But he says he will be back. He's not going out like that. As far as the surgery, there was a blood clot found in his leg. The, he says that the surgery went fine and that he is okay. So that is positive news. Whenever you see a guy like this that is a baseball legend go down, then obviously... No matter what team you're a fan of, whether you like or hate the Yankees, it is never something that you want to see happen. Yeah, that's a huge blow for the Yankees, and that might come back to hurt them in October. I don't know if Robinson's ready for the full closer role. I'm kind of shocked that they didn't go with Soriano, because Soriano has proved himself as a closer spot. I think he had 45 saves a couple years ago with Tampa Bay, so it's kind of surprising, but they're both good pitchers, but I think it'll hurt them in the long run. Yeah, no, I, and they're paying Soriano closer money. What they did yeah. was they brought him in there to eventually be the successor. And Robertson's a really good pitcher. Maybe Ra I was never a real huge fan of Rafael Soriano, but his last season closing, you're right, he had 45 saves, he was an all-star, and I, I do believe that he needed to be the guy that was given that option because of his familiarity with the role, his experience down the stretch as a closer with the Tampa Bay Rays a few years ago, and even with the Braves uh, the season before that, I think it was 2008 or 2009, I don't really get why they did not make him. I guess for, you're just going to eat it for the next two years and have a $13 million setup, man. I really do not get that move at all. Moving on, though, and we will continue with the Yankees notes, Andy Pettit, who missed the entire last season, retired, came back this season will make his MLB return this Sunday against the Seattle Mariners. Now, I've, everyone knows that the Mariners do not exactly have a reputation as being the greatest hitting team, but they actually have not been necessarily terrible hitting-wise, at least to this point this season. 
And I've seen a lot of scouts, and I've, I've seen the numbers and the box scores from what he's done, Andy Pettit, in the Yankees AA affiliate with the, the Trenton Thunder. And he really has not looked good. The other day he threw like six innings and gave up like four earned runs. He, he really has not looked good. And you don't need him to go down there and throw a perfect game. But I think somewhat the Yankees are putting too much pressure on a guy who hasn't thrown in a few years. And John's mentioned this a couple times so far, and I agree with it, that... Andy Pettit could have almost been what the Phillies did with Pedro Martinez the other year where you sign him in like late July and you bring him off for the stretch run. I think what they're trying to do, and at age 40, I'm not sure if it's going to work, is make him what he was a few years ago, make him your number two or three starter now that you've lost Michael Pineda for the entire season with the uh, shoulder surgery, or elbow surgery I should say. And I'm just not sure he's going to be able to hold up for an entire season, especially not only that he's at age 40, but considering that he did not pitch at all last season, I don't know if his arm has the strength in it to pitch almost a whole season, three-quarters of a season. Yeah, I don't see him pitching a whole season at all either. I'm actually very shocked. I thought he might not even be called up till June, maybe July. I think they might be rushing him. And I think he'll struggle in his first couple starts. I mean... It makes sense to sign him like closer to the playoffs, somewhere around there, June, July, maybe. I think they're rushing him completely. He's going to throw too many innings, especially for not pitching last year. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can't keep him in double A forever. Eventually, the guy gets bored, and I understand that. And I'm not t acting like that's not part of it, too, that he is pitching in double-A. You can't get amped for a double-A start when you've pitched in the World Series and you're five times wor five time world champion. I get that. But overall, I just do not think that he's ready to come up, and I think that the Yankees might have actually been better served waiting until this point in the season to actually sign him so you could bring him through and begin the process now rather than signing him in the offseason. We'll see what happens. I mean, the last season that we saw at him, he was really good, but if you go back to previous two or three years before that, he had an ERA of like four and a half. He was there because he was Andy Pettit, but overall he had not been that great of a pitcher since he had come back from Houston, but we'll see what happens there. Albert Pujols has finally broken the streak. 250-some players had hit home runs before Albert Pujols this season, and for a guy who's in the first year of a nine or ten year deal, I think it's, I think it's a nine year deal, where you're making about $25 million a season. It is a scary sign, even if you're not an Angels fan, the fact that this guy took a month to hit a home run. Now, it is Albert Pools, and I think he'll get on track, but to hit the 37 home runs he's averaged throughout his career, I was reading this somewhere the other day, I forget where, he would need to average a home run every like 11.3 at-bats. There's only about five or six hitters in the history of the MLB who have done that amount of work, and... Albert Pools has already so far not worked out for them, and I'm not saying that it was the wrong move to sign him, but they did a really poor thing by backloading this contract because they're going to be screwed years five through nine, really, because not only is Albert Pools not going to be worth that money, he's not going to be worth close to that money, and you're not going to be able to go out and get other players. If you were going to backload it or frontload it, you could have put it on the front of the contract and then said at the end, okay, well, if he's only making 11 or $15 million, that's a lot more manageable than $25 million. Or even if he's only making 17 or 18, that's a lot more manageable than $25 million. Instead, they decided to backload it so they could sign C.J. Wilson and go for the here and now. And so far, that has not worked. And, I mean, they're going to be screwed with Albert Pools in a few years. That being said, John, do you think that this is what's going to propel Albert Pools and he's going to figure it out from here on out and he's all good? Or... Is he still kind of in that funk? I think he's still in the funk, quite honestly. When I, he's just swinging at balls in the pitch, in the dirt. I mean, he's not looking comfortable at the plate whatsoever. Even the home run the other day, he was way out in front of that pitch. I know it was a home run, but that's not Albert Pujols. You see Albert Pujols hitting 450-foot home runs. I mean, this guy's not locked in. Went 0 for 4 yesterday again. I mean, I don't know what's going wrong with him. I don't know if it's mentally or he's hurt, but he does not look comfortable at all. Like, I wouldn't be worried if he's hitting the ball, like, to just getting out. But he's swinging at bad pitches. He's striking himself out, swinging at pitches in the dirt. He just does not look comfortable at all right yeah, now. Yeah, and if there was ever a guy that I thought could adjust to going to a new team, it would have been Albert Pools because 
He's like that constant professional guy. And he, I mean, he's one of the top 10 right hand hitters of all time. He'll probably be in the top 5 before his career is over. But things do not look good so far for Albert Pools. That's certainly something that we will continue to keep you updated on. The guy, whether he's still the best player in the game, I think right now that we will talk about the two best players in the game right at the end of this video. But overall, he's the face of the MLB right now, and it's really tough to see this happening to him so far. Sunday Night Baseball, let's set the stage for what happened last Sunday. First of all, I'll put it this way. You guys know I'm a Phillies fan, but I'll put it this way. Phillies fans, for the last f so a few years, I should say, couldn't get that out of my mouth, for the last few seasons have kind of gone down and made Nationals Park essentially another home game because it's not that long of a drive from Philly up to Washington, D.C. It's about a two-hour drive, maybe two-and-a-half-hour drive. So you take that drive up, uh, maybe three hours. You take that drive up, and... The Nationals have been a bad team, and the fans have been showing up. I don't blame Nationals fans for not showing up. If you have a bad team, I don't understand paying the $30 and driving there and ending up paying $20 more for parking and $15 for a hot dog and beer. I understand not doing that, but the Phillies have taken over that park. So what the Nationals did prior to the season is they launched the Take Back the Park campaign with Natitude, which is probably the cheesiest thing I've ever heard in my life. They launched that campaign, and what they did was they did not allow people outside of Maryland or D.C. to buy tickets to any of the Phillies games, especially in this series, because they got tired of Phillies fans taking over this park. So, if you're in Philadelphia, you cannot call up the Nationals and say, or you can call the Nationals ticket hotline or go on their website and buy tickets if you did not have a visa that was registered in Maryland or D.C. You can still buy them on StubHub, and that's how some of the Phillies fans did ultimately get in, but it was certainly different. So it, you could kind of see a rivalry brewing. Bryce Harper, the phenom, I'm calling him the LeBron James, the MLB, because he has similar type hype as what LeBron James did coming in, except it's not covered by ESPN because... Baseball's not a sexy sport, but when he came up, it's, it's kind of similar in the expectations. Bryce Harper is a 19-year-old outfielder for the Washington Nationals who is supposed to be a first battle Hall of Famer, superstar, one of the best players in the game within the next couple seasons. So he, he people kind of don't like how he carries himself, though. People have kind of gotten the impression him coming through Myers that he's a really good player. And Matt Kemp was talking about how good of a player he was yesterday on an interview he did on PTI. But people have kind of no mentioned throughout his time coming up the Myers that he carries himself the wrong way, that he's one of those guys that will step out of the box in between every pitch, he'll fix his batting gloves, he'll uh, fix his fighting, fitting necklace, and... Uh, People, he walks with a swag that people don't like. And when you're a young rookie coming up, there's kind of a price to pay for that. And that's the way that baseball has kind of always been. Not, I, know, I don't make the rules. I'm just explaining how they are. So, first inning of this Sunday night baseball game, Cole Hamels beans him in the back. And you can almost tell a lot of times when he hits him in the back, either he lost it or he was trying to hit him. Because... Most of the time, you're not going to try and hit anybody anywhere in the back because hitting someone in the back with a 95 mile an hour fastball, it sends a message. It backs him off the plate, which Bryce Harper is notorious for being on top of the plate. He has a very close stance, a stance similar to, uh, I believe they compared it to Chipper Jones. But uh, people do not like how close he stands to the plate. He's 19. People don't like all the hype surrounding him. Kind of same way veterans in the NFL didn't like the hype surrounding him. Tim Tebow or, you know, veterans in the NBA didn't like when LeBron James originally came in, all the hype that surrounded him. So he hits him, and he goes to first base. And then he ends up getting all the way around to third base, and Cole Hamels in that same inning goes to pick somebody off, and Bryce Harper steals home in a seat. That's a done deal. That part, The Bryce Harper part of this is out. Then Cole Amos comes up a few innings later, and no one on base, and you could hear some of the, the, the announcer said, that this is a spot that you want to watch, he might get hit. Cole Hamels gets hit on this pitch, but it's not on the back. And this is the one thing that the media hasn't given you because they're sucking Bryce Harper's you-know-what so far. But Cole Hamels gets hit, it would have been on the knee. It was right below the knee, but he had to move out of the way to make sure it was not the knee. Both benches were worn and nothing else came of it. Now that's kind of a to-be 
continued thing? Because throughout this remaining amount of the season, you think that tensions are going to boil over because these might end up being two teams competing for this division. So Cole Hamels, after the game, <coughs> admits that, yeah, he was hitting Bryce Harper on the back on purpose. You hit a guy on the back on purpose. The one problem I had is that Cole Hamels got hit almost on the knee. You don't do that. You throw the guy's back if you're going to hit them. That's one of those unwritten rules of baseball, but it's kind of a common sense thing. If you hit somebody in the back, they might get a bruise. If you hit someone on the knee, you could really mess up something and put them out, maybe even ruin their entire career. That's not something you do. But anyway, Cole Hamels, after the game, talking to the media, goes in and says, yeah, you know, I was welcoming him to the big leagues, kind of smiles, and essentially says that, yeah, he threw it out, threw at him on purpose. The MLB gives out a five-game suspension to Cole Hamels, and as a Phillies fan, quite honestly, I found this pretty funny. But, John, do you think he deserved the suspension, and what were your overall thoughts? Because I, I don't understand how he gets a suspension, but the guy on the Nationals doesn't. That's the part, I, or Jordan Zimmerman, I should say, does not get the suspension. Yeah, I definitely thought Zimmerman should have got suspended as well. I mean, retaliation's retaliation, but I mean, if you're going to throw, like you said, you do not throw at someone's legs. That's just, that's like hitting someone in the head almost. Not as bad, but... It's the next closest hit. thing. Yeah, you just throw him at, throw him at, throw it at his back and it's over with. <coughs> One thing I do like, though, Cole Hamill's... As we all know, the Phillies are in the National League. So once you hit someone, if you're going to hit someone, do it in the National League because the pitcher hits. So when the pitcher hits, you're going to get plunked most likely. So, so that part I didn't mind at all. I mean, National League, go after someone, and you'll take it too. The other part, though, I don't let, get this at all. Why would you tell the media you hit him? You just knew there was a sus suspension or a fine. I mean, that's just setting yourself up, quite honestly. I didn't get that at all. I know a lot of people, including Jim Leland, he actually thought he should have got 15-game suspension. I think that's way too harsh. I think five games is perfectly fine. Now, Mike Rizzo, the Nationals, their GM, was fine because he said that Hamels was a fake tough guy, whatever. You know, when the GMs get involved in this stuff, it's kind of like you're not out there on the field. You really have nothing to do with the game. That's not your place to make that decision if he's a fake tough guy. That's for someone in that locker room to say. Jason Worth, as we mentioned, out for 12 weeks now. He did uh, break his wrist, and he will need wrist surgery, so that is something to watch as well. A few news and notes, and then we'll get back into some more broad topics. Francisco Cordero of the Toronto Blue Jays, formerly of the Reds, Brewers, and a few other teams. Francisco Cordero has been relieved of his closing duties with the Milwaukee Brewers. He's blown three saves in five attempts and has an ERA over nine, so it's pretty self-explanatory. He didn't even try and act like he shouldn't have been removed from the spot. He pretty much said that he understood, so he has been relieved of his closing duties there. Uh, Sergio Santos will probably be the guy that goes in, and he should have been the guy there from the beginning. Josh Beckett with Clay Buckholtz reportedly. Josh Beckett the other day missed his starting or his start, but reportedly, according to I think it was a Boston Globe, was out was seen playing golf prior to missing his start with his teammate Clay Buckholtz. Josh Beckett was the same guy last year that was caught eating beer or drinking beer and eating chicken wings in the dugout on the day that he wasn't pitching. It was fried chicken, actually. And it's not like anyone else wouldn't do that, but when you're down the stretch and, you know, you don't really, your team's choking, that's not something that you want to be caught doing. And it's something that I had a problem that the media brought it out after they choked and they didn't bring it out while the entire thing was going down, but that's how it went down. So we already kind of had a target on his back coming into the season. He hasn't pitched well. He's had a lot of injury issues throughout his time in Boston, although he's been relatively successful to come out and then miss a start because you end up, or whatever the injury was, to miss a start but be able to play golf before it. And Clay Buckholz has missed time with injuries too, and he's been really disappointing after a really nice start to his career. You know, it, it's, it's really, this sums up what the Red Sox are right now. It's simple as that. Yeah, quite honest, I think Josh Becky deserves his suspension if this is true. They need to prove something in Boston right now. They need to tell their guys, get them to tell them to get their acts together. They're not acting professional at all right now. I mean, the other game against uh, who was it? Baltimore in the 17 inning game. 
Darnell McDonald, when he gave him the three-run shot to Adam Jones, I know he's in a uh, position player pitching. He smiles after he gives up the three-run home run in the dugout. He's laughing about it. Oh, I cannot not, stand when people do that when I'm playing sports. I don't get that at all. I mean, if you want to win, win. I mean, sh show him some heart. I mean, it's just ridiculous. No one cares on this team. It's That's good, the like, problem, is it? Somehow... Between winning two World Series in the last ten years, being a team that goes to the playoffs pretty much every other year, <coughs> excuse me, somehow a losing culture has come in, and they still somehow managed to win games last year. But a losing culture has crept into this team, and it's just not coming out, right, or it's not going away right now. And I don't get what what it is. And I, I don't understand guys like Darnell McDonald. Those are the guys that you look back on in 10 years and when you're on sports radio and you're talking about some of the guys that you hated the most on your team. If I was a Red Sox fan, Darnell McDonald would be the guy I brought up. For me, it's like a guy like Travis Lee on the Phillies. One of those type of jokes that doesn't care at all. And, I mean, to see a guy laughing when you give up that type of hit, I, I, don't, I don't get it. When yeah. you're out there in sports, it bothers me that... There's these people that actually have talent but don't care. And then there's people like me and John who really care about sports and probably aren't going to the MLB anytime soon or any other professional sports league because we play other sports, or at least I do. I don't know about John. But the point is, I don't understand athletes that take it for granted. And apparently that's what's ended up happening with the Boston Red Sox. And they're becoming an extremely unlikable team. From that team in 04, that while we found out later that it was pretty much all roids, it's. It was a likable team. Kevin Millar, although he's an awful analyst, was a likable, funny guy. Manny Ramirez, at times, was a very likable guy. David Ortiz, probably all steroids, especially the first two. But they were a likable team, and I, I just don't know what's happened over the past two or three seasons that's made them what they are now. Yeah, I mean... Boston, I mean, they don't even, it doesn't look like they care. I mean, enough said about Boston. I'm sick about talking about Boston all the time. And if you're going to play the game, play the game right. If you, I mean, you you're going to pay millions of dollars. I mean, show up to the ballpark ready to play. Just using this as an example, Juan Pierre, I was reading an article the other day. He shows up to the ballpark, does his batting practice, and does in the cages seven hours before the game, every game. Every game he does this, out of 162 game schedule, that's someone you want on your ball club, not someone who's going to smile after giving up a moonshot to Adam Jones. I mean moonshot, that thing was crushed. And then he's just smiling in the dugout. That I don't get that at all. Obviously, Darnell McDonald's on a pitcher, but I mean, 17 innings into it, he had to come in the game. It's a mess down there, let's just put it that way. Yeah. One final news and note, and that, well, two actually. Royals pitcher Jonathan Sanchez, this is according to Dane Nodler, we've had him on this show before, CBS Baseball reporter, the best in the business, has been placed on the DL. And then another sad note to uh, kind of wrap this up before we get into our final debate, Red Sox PA announcer of the final, or for the last nine seasons, including their two World Series titles, Carl Bean today was killed in a single car crash. So our thoughts and prayers certainly go out to Carl Bean. And PA announcer is kind of that one thing that you take for granted when you go to the game, or even you hear it on TV and the radio in the background. PA announcer, like in the NBA, if you're a real fan, you notice a PA announcer because they say whoever scores every point and they put in their own little twists on everything. These type of announcers, for the most part, just say the player's name and they might get a little excited, but it's kind of just part of the game and you take it for granted. And... This guy was one of the best overall PA announcers in the game, and it's really sad to see something like this happen. Yeah, definitely. It's very sad. Okay, so last night, Josh Hamilton against the Baltimore Orioles steps up in the first inning, hits a home run. Third inning, fifth inning, hits a home run. So he's at three home runs. That's a huge game. And why the Orioles continued to pitch to him is beyond me. But the Orioles in the ninth inning, he steps up. And Josh Hamilton hits four home runs, becomes the first player since 2003 to hit a home or to hit four home runs in a game. 16th player of all time. No one has ever hit five home runs in a game. And I know that that almost seems impossible, but considering how long baseball has been around, hitting five home runs seems impossible. Considering how long baseball has been around, it is kind of surprising 
that we've never seen anyone that's hit five home runs in a game. But Josh Hamilton hit four home runs in a game. That is incredible. And I mean, Josh Hamilton. I don't. A lot of people kind of forgot about him last season for whatever reason. He plays on a very good team, but he is the best player on that team. Two years ago, this was a guy that won the AL MVP, and he missed like 30 games. That's how good of a season he had. He hit like 360. Josh Hamilton is a superstar, one of the best players in the game right now, probably the best center fielder in the game right now. And to hit four home runs in the game, I was talking about this with KJ, one of the guys that works with me at the Real Sports Talk. I mean, to hit... Two home runs in a game is a pretty big accomplishment. And when someone hits three games in a, uh, three home runs in a game, if you're at that game, that's one of the things we say. I was at a game where someone hit three home runs. When, when Ryan Braun hit three home runs the other week, that was a huge accomplishment. Now, everyone wanted to make steroid jokes and testosterone, whatever jokes that they could think of. But the point was that it's a huge thing. When Curtis Granderson did it a few weeks ago, it was a huge thing. To hit four home runs in a game is really stupid on another team's part to continue pitching to you. But it is something really cool to see, and I mean it's incredible. Yeah, I mean four. I can't even imagine. I mean <coughs> four home runs. That's like something you do in a wiffle ball game. I don't know how these guys do that, and like that's unbelievable. I mean, I can't even imagine that. I mean, four home runs, three home runs is a ton. Two home runs, like you said, is a very good accomplishment. I just can't even imagine four. Now, one of the things that I've seen today is that. Uh, a poll question. I like to go around and do the polls on all the websites, see how buy some of them are. And you look at the ESPN main question today. I don't know if it's still up at this time, but it was this morning around 10 o'clock when I was in school. And we were looking over this question where it said, what's more impressive, Phil Pumber, the White Sox who threw a perfect game the other week, or hitting four home runs in a game? Well, hitting four, or well, throwing a perfect game is an incredible accomplishment. And to not walk anybody, anything like that, and it doesn't happen a ton. To do that is an incredible accomplishment. I'm not taking away. Only 21 guys ever have thrown perfect games. But a lot of people do throw no-hitters, and that's become more prevalent in today's game. And that might be why. But considering that we, the last person was like Sean Green of the Dodgers, and Sean Green has been out of the game for five years now, to hit five home runs in a game, I mean, it's... I don't know how you can't say that four home runs isn't more impressive than a perfect game. Yeah, I agree with you completely on that. I mean, four home runs, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I'm sure that more people have thrown a perfect game than more people have hit four home runs in a game. Yeah, there, it's 21 have thrown a perfect game, 16 have hit four home runs, and a lot of those 16 have not been recent ones. Yeah. Josh Hamilton last night also set the American League record for total bases in a game with 18. So he had a great overall game, even in the one at bat, or it might have been two at bats, that he did not hit a home run in. So a great game for him last night. And he also had eight RBIs, which, it, I mean, it isn't really a ton when you hit uh, four home runs, but eight RBIs is still a, a ton overall. Final note, or the final thing I want to get into is I want to compare Josh Hamilton, who was the, the AL MVP at this point, with Matt Kemp, who was the NL MVP at this point. I don't think there's really any debating about that. Let me read you off some of the stats, and then we'll give our opinions, and you guys in the chat room can also do the same, or in the comments section, whatever. Josh Hamilton and Matt Kemp, let me give you the basic stats. <coughs> For Josh Hamilton... He's hitting 406 this year with 14 home runs. Four of those came last night. 36 RBIs, an on-base percentage of 458, and a slugging percentage of 840. Matt Kemp is hitting 404 with 12 home runs, 27 RBIs, a 488 on-base percentage, and an 817 slugging percentage. While Josh Hamilton's stats look better, I think that most people believe Matt Kemp right now is the best player in the game. And if you take away what Josh Hamilton did last night, then it takes him down to less home runs than him and actually just about the same amount of RBIs. So, And the thing that Hamilton has the advantage in the RBIs is that he has a better overall lineup around him, probably the best in the game with guys like Michael Young, Ian Kinsler, uh, Mitch Moreland, Adrian Beltre, the whole lineup is really a, a stacked lineup. So I think overall he has a better lineup around him, and he benefits from that. They're both great players, and they're both center fielders as well. And I, I think that I'd take Matt Kemp over Josh Hamilton. Yeah, I agree with you also. 
They have both le- legitimate shots at the Triple Crown this year. I know it's very early, but if anyone in the majors can do that, it's definitely these two guys. Um, awesome baseball players, great baseball players, you could say. I could see them both having Hall of Fame-like careers at the end. I mean, it's very hard because they're just both just great ball players. but I'd have to go with Kemp. Not, I mean, Hamilton's a good fielder, but Kemp Scott is much more faster. Um, cannon of an arm. Josh Hamilton has a decent arm. He's I also mean, about both, four years younger, too. Yeah, it's true also. I mean, I think his career stats at the end, and one thing you got to consider, I know it's right now, but um, the drug and alcohol will always haunt Josh Hamilton. It will always be tainted by him, even though... It didn't affect his baseball career, or well, baseball stats, we yeah. should say. People still talk about it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't think that that really changes this debate, but you're right that that will always be something he carries and kind of something. I do see a lot of people on Twitter that worship Josh Hamilton. I also see that guy that has to always come in there and be the smart ass and say, oh, we're worshiping someone that did drugs and alcohol, w- whatever. I mean, when someone comes back from something like that, it is cool to see whatever. That's your baseball show for this week. We'll be back next Tuesday, so a short week this week to think about it. Baseball is finally getting going now, real end of the season. I'm Tim, along with John. Hit me up on Twitter, at CashKelly underscore TRSC. Hit John up at Burns Sports. Like The Real Sports Talk on Facebook and check out The Real Sports Talk at YouTube.com slash Mr. We'll send it back over to Bruce now.